Okay, so my name's Paul Godsmark. I'm with the Canadian Automated Vehicles Centre of Excellence, or, or CAVCO. Uh, we basically try and help people understand the socio-economic impact of autonomous vehicles and how that will affect their operational and business models. And uh, I'm delighted to um, be a moderator on this panel as, as we discuss this. Autonomous vehicles, are we ready? Uh, are we ready indeed? Um, just a quick few words of introduction. You already got introduced to our panel members. So Darren, put your hand up please. Kenny and Timothy. So I'm going to ask them to say a little bit about themselves later on. Um, and after I've finished speaking, uh, I'm going to ask Timothy to just give us a, a, a quick, uh, I think a 10 minute presentation, an overview of autonomous vehicles. So. For me, my, my passion around autonomous vehicles, it started about seven years ago, and it's when I realized that the fact that the car, if it can drive itself, it's going to have a fundamental impact on society. And it took me about six months of thinking about this to, to realize just how profound that change will be, just because a car can drive itself. And how close are we? The answer is incredibly close. Uh, the uh, Waymo, a company that has spun out of Google, they've been doubling down on basically saying they are going to start commercial operations down in Phoenix this year. Uh, so this isn't science fiction, this is gonna happen this year, uh, and the expectation is it, it could roll out quite quickly. So some more context, autonomous vehicles, the, the whole transportation and mobility sector is a $10 trillion global sector according to a Morgan Stanley estimate. That is some five times bigger than the smartphone sector. So it's no wonder that some of the biggest companies in the world that were created out of that smartphone and social media sector are now rushing into and, and getting involved with the autonomous vehicle development. Uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a huge land grab taking place at this, at this moment in time. Um, and we estimate at CAVCO that in, fi in, that in about 15 years, autonomous vehicles will be about 20% of the economy. So it's not going to be generating GDP, but it will be replacing uh, and disrupting many of the businesses that currently make up 20% of the economy in mobility. So that's, it's, it's, it's all on, everything about autonomous vehicles is on a big scale, a similar scale as the internet in terms of how it will impact our lives. It's also worth noting that autonomous vehicles are basically sensors on wheels. At the moment, those sensors are dedicated to the driving task. But once that driving task is solved and you have spare compute power on, your vehicle, on board your vehicle, what else are those is gonna be done with that data uh, and the sensors are picking up all of this data, everything in the world around us. What does that mean? Um, autonomous vehicles are also the first autonomous system that we're likely to experience in our everyday lives. Now, autonomous systems uh, will result in robots, autonomous robots, robots in our homes, robots working out in the world, doing manual work and other things. So, Whatever happens with autonomous vehicles, we need to follow very closely because very soon after that, the autonomous systems and the autonomous robots are coming. The benefits of autonomous vehicles have been talked about a great deal. We're expecting huge safety benefits. I don't know if you know this, but two to 6% of Canada's economy, depending on how you measure it, actually goes towards um, the, the privilege of us all being able to crash our cars. I mean, that's frightening, but two to 6% of GDP is tied up in car crashes. Um, emissions, we're expecting autonomous vehicles in cities in particular to be electric, and that's gonna see a massive reduction in emissions. Uh, and apparently 32% of us, according to one study in Canada, live so close to a road that our, our health is materially affected. It's taking uh, several years off of our lives. Um, it, autonomous vehicles are going to save us time. If we're not a slave to the driving task, then what can we do with that time? You know, are we going to be watching YouTube cat videos, for instance? And congestion. If everyone owns an autonomous vehicle and the 30% of us that don't have a driving license can now own an autonomous vehicle, it will be a dystopian hell. There will be so many vehicles on the road, it will be terrible congestion. But hopefully Lyft and others will tell us about 
transportation as a service and the fact that we won't want to own a vehicle anymore, in which case one autonomous vehicle could replace maybe five or six private vehicles. And if we ride share, there could be less vehicles on the road and it could be a utopian um, uh, scenario. We don't know how it's all going to play out. So autonomous vehicles are going to affect how and where we live and work, and they're going to change our business models and operational models, how we do business, and every single one of us is, in this room is a stakeholder in every single organization. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Timothy. He's going to give us a 10-minute presentation, and then we're going to have a, a panel discussion and then have some questions from you afterwards. So, Timothy, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Paul, and thank you uh, to Innovate BC and everyone here at, uh, at BC Tech uh, for inviting Lip to be part of this panel. Really excited for the conversation today. Uh, my name is Timothy Burr. I handle our public policy for Lyft for all of the West Coast, and I'm responsible for our British Columbia engagement. We're trying to bring Lyft to Vancouver and BC uh, in 2018. Um, want to talk today about, uh, about on one question that we're here to answer, which is, are we ready uh, for autonomous vehicles? I'm gonna talk from a consumer perspective and look at all the indicators from the growth of ride sharing uh, over the past five or so years uh, that, that show really set the foundation for, for why consumers are ready for AV. I'm gonna talk about our vision for deploying autonomous vehicles uh, and also talk a bit about what it's gonna take to get there and talk a little bit about you know, what it means for our communities, our cities, uh, and a little bit on the regulatory side. So if you don't know Lyft, Lyft was the first peer-to-peer -peer company, uh, peer-to-peer -peer ride-sharing company founded uh, in 2012 in San Francisco. It was actually the second peer-to-peer ride-sharing company that our co-founders, uh, John uh, Zimmer and Logan Greed, founded. They had founded Zimride in 2007, then sold that and, and began Lyft with the seed money in 2012. It was founded with a, a simple mission, and that was to um, uh, improve people's lives with the world's best transportation, and really to fundamentally get people to think differently about car ownership, um, and empowering them uh, to perhaps think about and consider living a, a car-free or car-light lifestyle. We are the fastest growing rideshare company in the United States. I'm excited to report that just this week we announced 35% market share across the US, um, with over 40% in, um, in some major cities in the US. So Lyft was really born with that vision, but it was actually born out of a frustration, and that was uh, how we utilize our cars. One of our co-founders grew up about LA, and other than Hollywood, I think the other thing everyone knows about LA is how bad traffic is. Really, truly w wanted to, to create a company where you can help, uh, help resolve this problem. Um, our cars are the uh, second highest household expense. We spend more on car ownership a year than we do on food. So other than your housing itself, um, we spend way too much money. On average, uh, in the US, it's $9,000 per family per car. It's actually higher here in Vancouver. Uh, and it's a massively underutilized asset. Uh, our cars are spent parked 96% of the time. And when we do decide to drive, 80% of the seats in the vehicle are, of, are vacant. It's a fancy way of saying we like to drive by themselves and we all by ourselves and we all know what the result is. It's congestion uh, and all the, the different issues um, without you know, filling up those seats in the car. So in today's world, not just in transportation but in many industries, we're seeing that you no longer need to own something in order to enjoy the benefits of it. I don't own CDs, it's been a while since I have. Uh, if my Spotify isn't working, I start freaking out. I, 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 use, I stream music. Uh, when it comes to DVDs or watching TV shows, I, we have Netflix. We use these streaming services. And so we're getting used more, more and more uh, used to not having to own something to enjoy the benefits from it. Here in Vancouver, the number one car sh uh, sharing uh, city, at least in North America, if not the world, um, folks are starting to, to see that you can actually you know, pool these resources together. For us, ride sharing, uh, has really been the harbinger of a larger change, which is the shift from having to own a car uh, to being able to utilize uh, transportation as a service, and this is absolutely critical to the development of autonomous technology. So when do we see this happen? You see it when reliability, affordability, uh, and just the, the experience of being able to ride in a car and the convenience um, all match you know, levels of what you'd expect with your own car ownership or exceed that. 
for Lyft users, over 50% of our users tell us that they drive less or use their personal car less because of Lyft. And in 2017, almost a quarter million passengers told us they actually stopped using their cars uh, because of the availability of Lyft. When you're able to, uh, to, to get to those, those levels and, and transportation of a service makes sense, and what we see for autonomous uh, technology is tremendous benefits for consumers. Over nine, this is 90, but it's about 95% of miles can be served by on-demand electric self, uh, self-driving fleets or autonomous vehicles, and it'll really bring down the cost of transportation uh, as a whole. So when we talk about transportation as a service and what it means for autonomous technology, there's four main pillars I wanna hit on today, and that is uh, connected, autonomous, shared, and being electric. These are the four key paths to deployment of autonomous vehicles. Connected, so the Lyft platform is all about connecting drivers and passengers. Uh, we now are live across 95% of the United States, so 95% of the US population has access to Lyft. Uh, and then in December, we launched Toronto, uh, really excited for that, um, and Ottawa as well. Uh, we're now doing well over a million uh, rides a day, and we think of these as Lyft as connections between driver and passenger. So we know that people are adopting and getting are, are quick to, to utilize the technology. I mean, it was not that long ago that we at Lyft were trying to, you know, convince folks that it was safe to share a ride with another sort of general member of the public who had been through all the screening methods. Uh, and, you, you know, it, it's, it's been quick that people have adopted and they found that this was a safe and fun way and affordable and reliable way to travel. Um, so connecting rides is a key part of this shift in consumers um, towards autonomous technology. I want to spend a few moments here talking about Lyft's sort of dual strategies when it comes to the testing and deployment of autonomous technology. So we have uh, what you can see on the left side here is what we're calling our open platform. So a lot of these uh, providers, big companies such as GM or Drive AI, Ford, Aptiv, Waymo, Jaguar, Land Rover, Newtonomy, just some of the names, these are all uh, manufacturers, folks who are developing autonomous technology but we're par pairing with them so that they can deploy that technology onto Lyft's platform, right? People are used to using Lyft platform uh, and, and these companies can partner with us and we're, we're looking at partnership opportunities really across uh, the US and, and beyond. And then the other side of our sort of uh, autonomous uh, strategy is we are building our own self-driving system. Um, we opened up a level five engineering center down in Palo Alto uh, and they're really just, you know, focused on, on building our own system out. And we're really excited in March when we announced a partnership with Magna. Now, if you don't know Magna, Magna is a, a massive tier one uh, automotive, uh, automotive provider uh, actually based in Ontario. Um, you know, they get the benefits of working with a company like Lyft that has over five billion miles uh, worth of data. And we have the benefit of, of working with a really tremendous player in the automotive space such as, as, as Magna. So people ask, when is this gonna happen? When am I gonna be able to, to try a ride? And I didn't see a ton of hands go up um, when asked if you've ever ridden in an autonomous vehicle. You can do this now on the Lyft platform. If anyone's going to Vegas anytime soon, um, we just relaunched uh, our partnership in partnership with Aptiv, uh, an autonomous company um, where we, where right now it's operating at about 10 uh, uh, properties on the strip. Uh, you can pull out your Lyft app and you can opt in and what you'll see is what you see over on the right hand side which tells you you've matched with a self-driving ride. Uh, and you, you really, with safety drivers and everything, but you, you right now are able to go experience this technology. During CES, one of the other major sort of tech events on the west coast um, that was uh, in Vegas in January, um, we ran a test with Aptiv and we did over 400 rides. Uh, over 99% of those rides were in autonomous mode, so no hands on the wheel. Uh, and we got driver ratings of uh, 4.99 4. Uh, out of five, which we were excited about. And then we just re-announced that we're, we're ramping up to over 30 cars. So this is really exciting and, and this is a technology that you as a pub member of the public can experience now. So the shift to AV is not gonna happen overnight. Um, as the price of transportation comes down and transportation as a service uh, becomes something widely adopted, um, we recognize that we're gonna have a hybrid network. It's gonna be essential to the development of this technology. There'll be both human drivers on the Lyft platform as well as autonomous vehicles. And then a key component of this entire shift to transportation as a service is going to be essentially carpooling. Uh, and that is making sure that these autonomous rides are shared. 
Um, you know, there's visions where everyone owns their own AV, and, and that's not how we're seeing it at Lyft. We're seeing this, the benefits really to occur when people are willing to share a ride and, you know, split that ride in an autonomous vehicle. People ask, well, would anyone want to share a ride with another member of the public going along the same route? And the answer is yes. Uh, we have a product called Lyft Line that we launched in 2014. It allows parties who are traveling separate to, sh to split the ride. Uh, and over 40% of our rides in major markets are through Lyft Line. So we're seeing consumers ready to adopt uh, you know, this part of uh, what will be critical to autonomous technology, and that is sharing a ride. And then, of course, one of the pillars of developing autonomous technology is uh, doing what we can to make sure that these vehicles are electric and have as minimal of an environmental impact as they can. Lyft just announced uh, a major step uh, towards this, and we announced just last month uh, that we're going 100% carbon neutral uh, through our car carbon offsets program um, that we're really excited about. So by harnessing all these different pieces, and why are we doing this? Um, we truly see that if we work together on this, we can restore the vitality of our cities, expand mobility for all, and really, actually, if you think about it, if we spend less time having our cars parked all over the place, um, we have more opportunity to redesign some of those city spaces. If you take away some of that parking, this is when we reimagine um, some of these areas of our cities. This is not far from my house in San Francisco, uh, the former Central, Central Expressway, which is now a park in Hayes Valley. So just to conclude here, are we ready for autonomous? And I want to set this up because a key question to that is, are people ready for ride sharing? Because those regulations and the development of people utilizing the services really do pave the way for autonomous. Here in, uh, in British Columbia, we're seeing from a margin of seven to one uh, that Vancouverites are ready for this next important step to adopt ride sharing regulations. And just want to give a shout out, um, and this is a coalition that has been built around the development of those regulations and indicates that BC is not only ready to embrace ride sharing, but also ultimately autonomous technology. Thank you, everybody. Look forward to this discussion. Okay, Thank, thanks, Timothy. That's, that's fantastic. So, um, start with you, Darren. Very briefly, please introduce yourself and how your organization fits into the, uh, this autonomous vehicle ecosystem, please. Okay. My name is Darren Nakuda. I'm the CEO of a company called Mighty AI, based in Seattle. And we, provide, we work with auto manufacturers and tier one suppliers and startups on making sense of all the sensor data they're collecting in their cars. So we'll take the raw data, for example, from a dash camera, and we'll help label it so that the, the deep learning systems and the AI systems can understand where there's pedestrians or lane markings or signs or any other um, features that are required in order to keep the car on the road. And Kenny, same again, please. Kenny Hawk, CEO of Mojo, uh, based here in Vancouver and Palo Alto. We're a cloud software company that is connecting up the unconnected. Uh, we launched just over a year ago have over 700,000 vehicles connected on our platform, over 7 billion miles of driving data. And initially, we're, we're connecting up the 1.2 billion cars that are already on the road. And how we play is, if you think about autonomous, and it's coming, no doubt about it, but you want to make it safe, and you want to make it better than what humans can do. So a better way to do that than to be able to use real live data with real vehicles that are out there today, that's step one. Uh, step two is, even when we have a bunch of autonomous vehicles and say, you know, snap your finger, tomorrow there's a million autonomous vehicles, it'd be really nice to know what that autonomous vehicle is driving next to, behind, ahead of, and share a little bit of information that you've got a rapid breaker or a rapid lane changer. Um, and then last but not least, uh, I love Lyft. Uh, I wish it was here. You know, one the, I love BC. One thing missing here is Lyft. But Lyft drivers are putting Wi-Fi in the car and getting more tips in a week than the Wi-Fi cost them in a month and letting customers know that they can get more things done while they're in the car is a, uh, is a great benefit. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for that <laughs> shout out. Um, so, I, I get, <laughs> so my role with Lyft, if, if it wasn't too clear, is I've been uh, really handling all of our, our local, state, or provincial uh, or province-wide engagement with electeds and staff um, and leaders. And over the course of when I joined Lyft, we had one state that had developed a set of uh, regulations, and now we're at 45 U.S. states. Um, you know, we have uh, 
regulations here in Canada um, that are in place out east and then regulations that are being worked on really across the country. Um, it's been a really exciting few years and uh, you know the, the setup and working on those initial ride sharing regulations have really provided an, an interesting and fascinating framework by which now we're revisiting you know with the same elected same staff and talking about developing autonomous uh, regulations. And I think now we have about 21 states or so that have some level of autonomous uh, regulations but there's still a lot of work to do. Okay, thank you. So, Kenny, you talked about safety. Safety, I think, is on a lot of people's minds. I, I'm sure a lot of uh, people read the, the headlines that about the fatality involving uh, an Uber autonomous vehicle uh, down there in, in Phoenix. So, in, in terms of safety, what do you think we should do? The more we regulate AVs to be safe, the longer it's going to take to get them here. But in Canada, uh, about 2,000 people a year die on Canadian roads every year. So the longer we delay this technology that could potentially save all these lives, the more people will die whilst we're developing tech to save them. What is, is, is there, what's the best way to balance safety and time of employment? Anyone? So, so I'll take a crack at that. I grew up in Detroit. My grandfather uh, tried to invent a seatbelt in the early days before seatbelts. And you could not imagine the pushback from the car companies on seatbelts. It's going to add another $4. Why would we spend that money? If you imagine today without seatbelts, and you look at every innovation since then, anti-lock brakes, I'm not going to trust a computer to apply the brakes for me. Now we have it in every vehicle. Airbags. Is the airbag going to go off when you're driving down the road at 100 kilometers an hour? Today, every car has airbags. So it's coming. It's clear it's coming. We just have to make it safe. And for me, you know, I think about how is this going to change? You know, when you have all this extra time, you know, in the, you look at an hour, hour and a half in the Bay Area per day that you waste on driving, what could you do with that time? One of my favorite books is Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, and he talks about the tribes that made it and the tribes that didn't. And one of the big changes that made tribes beat the other tribes was having enough time to stop and think and do something productive. And the big change was being able to store food up until then, you spent your whole day either killing or being killed or p looking for nuts or fruits or something to eat. You had no time to do anything else. Once the tribes learned how to store food, they could organize, they could plan, they could talk to each other, get to know each other, coordinate better, and they ended up surviving when the other tribes didn't. So you think about getting back an hour or an hour and a half of your day. What else could you do to get that much time? I think that's the biggest impact that this is going to have. I think you should store nuts in your BC and your cars in BC when you get them. Peanuts across the shelf. Darren, any, any thoughts on, on safety? Yeah, I think one of the most important things is that we have to continue this innovation. So there will be setbacks and they're very serious, but we have to think about the amount of lives that are being lost to human drivers every year and the improvements that we're making. So beyond uh, ABS, we're talking about, you know, advanced uh, driver assistance, uh, adaptive cruise control, lane keeping, traffic jam, all the places where as humans we get tempted, especially in this world where we all have our mobiles and we're looking at our phones to be distracted. Um, you know, we shouldn't do that. But the fact that we are guarded now in a way where we, when we are sitting in traffic for an hour, we can, we can have confidence that our car can stay where it is and know about its surroundings. One of the key things that we do at Mighty AI is we, we use humans to label the data. And we find that's a really important step in having people make that judgment is, you know, whatever a model or a computer, vi or computer vision system says about what's on the scene, we have humans validating that and saying, we, this is correct or it needs to be refined. This was a mistake. And that iteration and that uh, data is specific to locations especially because the human behavior is very different in different parts of the world. Drivers in, in Seattle versus Europe versus Singapore, very, very different. I know in Seattle, we don't cross the street if the light is red um, or if the crosswalk is red. Uh, certainly not the case in a lot of places where you have to be more aggressive. And um, so I think that like that level of detail is going to need to be had for to truly have safety and have this deployed worldwide. Okay. And, and if, I'm, if I may, I actually, it's interesting. I think California, which was the first state to develop ride sharing regulations, um, actually said it best, and this was way back in 2013, I guess not that long ago, um, but they indicated that the goal of the first set of the, that set of regulations was uh, to promote safety, enhance safety, 
while fostering innovations and being careful not to stifle innovation. And I think that was, you know, very, um, you know, is a perfect way to sort of cap uh, and capture what we're facing now with respect to autonomous technology. Then they were talking about, you know, all these new mechanisms and levels of transparency and what is it like when you have all this new information now when you're trying to obtain a ride or after you have a ride and all these new tools that technology enabled uh, us to have. Uh, and making sure people felt good, you know, comfortable and, and developing the technology. Um, and, and now we're really seeing that with AV, and I think you know, what most of the folks engaged in the industry always remind ourselves is why are we doing this? You know, the, in the US, the 36 plus thousand automobile deaths we have a year, over 90% of those being caused, human caused or human error in some capacity, um, not to mention you know, DUI and, 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 uh, and all those kind of uh, incidents. So I think always trying to remind ourselves um, you know, why we're doing this and how critical it, it, the future could be for preventing um, so, many for so many lives from being lost uh, is really important as we sit down to, to figure out what these regulations should look like. Okay. Thank you. So with, <clears throat> with all of us being stakeholders and all of our organizations being affected in some way, what, what, are, what for you, uh, what would you say the developmental milestones, the signs, the signals, um, the accomplishments that will, will tell us when this technology is coming and will give us an idea of how much of an impact it will have on our lives. Um, I think we're already seeing it. If you look at Waymo and the deployments they're, they're doing right now, um, if you look at Voyage, which is an American company that is doing deployments within retirement communities um, in the U.S., like we're seeing an impact of people who probably should not be driving anymore, but to whom mo mobility is super important. And so obviously they, they can do ride share, but that autonomy and that ability to get, get in the car and get them where they need to go safely, I think is a huge step in that direction. I've got a neighbor who is 96 years old and she still drives and she just went to get her driver's license renewed in California. And they, gave, they did her test, she had her glasses, she passed the written test, took the road test and they issued her a license for another four years. And she came back to them and she said, are, are you out of your mind? I'm 96, I'm not even gonna be alive in four years. How on earth can you give me a four year license? And she honestly doesn't want her license taken away until it needs to be taken away. And so she actually loves the idea that her 77 year old son is keeping track of how she drives and when she starts driving erratically enough, she will then be a only Lyft and Uber passenger, but she wants that freedom until she needs it. And technology, in that sense, is, it, it, it's amazing. It gives you freedom, but also gives you control. The time when it's gonna shift, for me, is when it's better than a human, and that is already today, but much better than a human. And I look at the adoption of Alexa, and it, as a disclaimer, Amazon's an investor. Alexa is loved by people because it finally is good enough that it can actually understand what you're talking about. Every voice technology before that was just not quite there. With driving, if you're not quite there, you're killing somebody. So it has to be much better than a human. It can't just be equal to a human, it has to be much better. Yeah, I, just to build off that, I, I would agree. I mean, the, the real main shift where we're gonna see uh, proliferation of the technology is gonna be when it's, you know, cheaper or just, just the same cost effective, just as reliable and, and a, you know, great experience um, or better, and which I, I think a lot of us would agree, better than driving your own car. Um, but in the short term, uh, you know, I think consumer adoption is gonna be really important. I mean, as I mentioned, not that many people have had the opportunity to experience autonomous technology. Um, and it's <laughs> kind of funny, um, when we had our a test during CES in Las Vegas, the majority of the headlines um, and there were, you know, the majority of headlines read something like this or the entry paragraph of the coverage was, that was so exciting for about 15 seconds. <laughs> and then I was just in the back of a car and I got used to it very quickly. And so, you know, for consumers, it's gonna be critical over the next few years you know, get out there. People in this room, I assume, are early adopters on, of technology. Uh, you know, give it a try. Let friends and neighbors. And so, hopefully, that question that you kicked us off with, Paul, with have it, have you tried it? Like, that's going to be kind of the buzz of folks is have they've ever been able to try autonomous technology? I will say, I, I did ride in the uh, autonomous lift in uh, at CES, and it was uh, very boring. <laughs> it, was, it was very fascinating and completely uneventful, and that was entirely exactly what you want. So it was it was a cool experience. Okay, so 
I've, I've been following the, the news ar across Canada whenever autonomous vehicles are mentioned, and the one characteristic of, of BC is that whenever autonomous vehicles get mentioned, the unions uh, react strongly, as, as I'm not surprised, uh, and are very concerned about the, the impact on, on jobs. How do, you, how do you see the impact on jobs? Well, so our platform involves all humans in the labeling process, so I'm kind of you know, actively thinking about how people spend their time. And uh, you know, one of the, the real futures I see is not machines taking over humans, but humans and machines working together. And so when you look at you know, what do we do today that we waste time on or that feel like rote tasks or very dangerous tasks, those are the ones that hopefully we can replace more quickly with machines. And then allow ourselves to add higher value, be more creative, um, and spend more time doing other types of jobs. So there is a, you know, people will lose their jobs, and that, that will happen. I think, you know, it's up to the, the governments and the industry to um, re-educate people, kind of retrain them into future jobs. And then, I think, you know, you have to look at some of the predecessors that we have. So um, the ATM is a good example. You know, when the, the ATM, the bank machine came out, I think you know a lot of people said, "Well, there's there goes all the bank tellers," and actually, if you look at the charts over time, you know the 50 years after the ATM came out, we actually have more more tellers than than before, and the rate's been growing. And the reason is because the cost of deploying a, a br bank branch went down. Like you no longer had to staff a branch with 18 people; you could staff it with eight people. You could open two branches, have better locations, more approximate to people, and. I think that kind of model shows that you know the flexibility and the the power of the unlock of the technology will just you know economically change how we how we do business. So I, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, back when it had two million people. Today it has less than eight hundred thousand people, and they missed a market wave to lower smaller cars that were more fuel efficient. They missed the technology wave. Detroit's finally coming back thirty years later, but I'd hate to see any industry go from two million to one million. And ignoring technology is not an answer, and having the unions fight it is not either. I worked at General Motors my junior year of college building engines. It took us almost seven hours to build a six-cylinder engine. The same six-cylinder engine with almost the same design, same specs, and Hyundai plant in America, in Huntsville, Alabama, took 63 minutes. Union, non-union, everything else is the same. You don't have a choice. It's happening. Yeah, and and from the from the Lyft perspective, I mean, obviously, the first question you know that's usually asked about the plans autonomous are, well, what does this mean for your drivers? You know, and um, for us, as kind of laid out, I mean, in the as we're building out a hybrid network, I mean, we firmly see the path forward that we're gonna that drivers will be a part of the Lyft network and we're gonna need more drivers and we continue to grow day after day um, as more and more people decide you know to get rid of their car um, and utilize these services and kind of one of something I want to hit on is it's not just about riding in a Lyft car it's really empowering folks to select from a range of options every time they take a ride or every time they leave their house the goal is to like allow them to leave their personal car at home and so that means that they have more opportunities to take bike share or car share or take public transportation. Um, about a quarter of our rides in, Cal in the Bay Area where we have the most history start our end at a trans transit stop. Um, and so just, you know, there's a, there, as we see more and more people decide to use this technology, we're going to need more drivers um, certainly over the course of, you know, the next decade or so. Um, and in terms of just automation in general, because it's not just a, a, an AV, I don't know if anyone else has seen a lot of the like videos rolling around lately of like robots jumping and doing some of this stuff that makes me slightly nervous. Um, this is, you know, for, for all kinds of, of jobs. I'm a lawyer by training. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of folks who'd love to see AI technology replace uh, attorneys in some capacity. Um, and it, it's just a matter of you know, understanding and educating people now what the impacts on our workforce can be. I think there's an interesting role for government. Uh, we're seeing this, you know, all over the place where governments are convening an important conversation of the future of the workforce. How are we making sure we're educating uh, folks and making sure that those, you know, training programs or retraining programs are available? Um, all important parts of this conversation. Fascinating. No one mentioned basic income. I'm a huge advocate of discussing basic income. 
Um, uh, who in the audience here is familiar with basic income and the experiment going on over, over in Ontario? Okay, quite a few of you. So basically the government would just guarantee everyone enough money every month to survive. No more than survive, but you wouldn't have to worry about surviving. Um, do you... Um, do you yeah. Well, okay, that, that was misreported. There was some fake news going on there, which again is another subject of this... Uh, I, just, I want to share one other point. Uh, I've got a young son, th just turned three yesterday. By the time he drives, there's going to be another billion vehicles on the roads. You think about the evolution from the early 1900s till now, it's been a slow roll as the developed world has added cars with their population growth. Now the rest of the world has gone from walking to bikes to scooters to cars or some kind of vehicle. Can you imagine another billion vehicles on the roads we have today? We just finished an analysis on our drivers in North America. The fastest area, the average trip speed, is just over 30 miles per hour. The slowest trip speed is about 16 miles per hour. And these are trips that are lasting 40 and 50 minutes. 16 miles an hour. I mean, you could go on a bike faster than that. So how are you going to handle a billion if you don't put autonomous and you don't get ride sharing? There's just no way we're going to be able to handle it. And that's just in the next 15 years. Okay, so we've only got a couple of minutes left. One last question. Uh, we're going to solve the world's problems here. What are the key policies and regulations that need to be put in place to help us get the best outcomes from AVs? Yeah, I, I think what we've seen right now are a lot of um, testing regulations being put in place. Um, what is it, also totally fascinating, though, about some of the places where testing regulations were put in place is, is you really have to build in, I guess, room for innovation because the technology has been moving so fast. Uh, like just to give the example um, of California, again, in 2012, California was the second state after Nevada to pass you know, regulations for uh, self-driving technology, but you know, those required a, a dri uh, uh, not only a safety driver, but a second person and a steering wheel and all these things. So it looked like a traditional car. Well, by the time that those, the actual regulations had been developed after the legislation had passed in 2012, it was you know, just like 2016 or so, and the technology had advanced so fast that all the industry players were already talking about level four and level five technology and wanting to be able to test without a steering wheel, without a safety driver, and that we have to prepare this technology to, to be able to handle real world scenarios, not just testing um, you know, in a private track somewhere. Um, so I, I would just say that, that leaving that room for innovation in the regulations is key. I'll go really fast, really simple one. Today in North America, you have to drive your car, produce smog to drive into a smog station that plugs in a computer that reads digital information that you could have just sent remotely. And then you drive back to wherever you went, generating even more smog, so you could be cer so certified that your car is actually conforming. It's ludicrous. Toronto is testing it. They're about to approve it. California, Oregon are about to approve it. Why in the hell should you drive and generate smog to get your smog tested when it could all be done remotely? The second is on surge charging. You know, Singapore, in the center of the orchard, it works. When you want to reduce the traffic, you increase the surge, just like Uber and Lyft do. If you want more people to carpool, that's another way to encourage them. So using dynamic pricing as you get enough cars connected makes this all a lot easier. Okay. Remote Last smog and surging. Last word, Darren, very briefly. Sure. Um, I think the one other area that hasn't been touched on is data privacy. And I think when it comes down to policy, there's going to be a lot of data about your behaviors while you're in a vehicle not just where the car is going, what's on the outside of the car, but what's on the inside of the car. So if you're distracted, what you're doing, and even beyond that, it's all biometric data. So there may, you know, as we look at other ways that AI is going to, you know, stare at your face, now you're staring at your face in a car constantly, and there's going to be a lot of um, information there. So I think there will be policies. I think a lot of this is going to be after ind industry driven because this is very advanced technology, um, but I think it's a big opportunity. Great. Well, thank you very much, all of you, Darren, Kenny. Timothy, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.